In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here. That you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins. And the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. We have uh, arrived here, Lord, to be in your presence to pray, to speak to you and to, to open our hearts to you. And as usual, we go to the gospel of the day. That'll be like the, the springboard for our reflection this afternoon here in Lincroft. And today's Gospel, from the Gospel of St. John, shows us Jesus who invites the Jews that already believed in him to persevere in their commitment to him. They had come to see what he said, they'd seen his miracles, his healings, his words, but they could sense around him that there was a growing hostility. In particular, there was the opposition of the scribes and the Pharisees. And maybe some of those who began to follow him didn't like this tension, this opposition. Maybe they were upset by it. And they were wondering if it was really worthwhile to continue to follow our Lord to go with Jesus. So he says these encouraging words. He says to them, now addressing those who are following him, right? He says, if you remain in, in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. You will be liberated, not under the auspices of some control, but you will be free. Hmm? To be set free implies that that one is already in prison in some way. If you are set free, you're set free from something that is hindering you from, you could say, living freely or, or, or being, you're, you're somehow being limited or constrained. Hmm? And it is really it is really wonderful to think that we can be set free by the truth. The truth about God, the truth about the world, the truth about salvation, about our purpose, our vocation, about ourselves, about who we are, our life, our purpose. That if we grasp onto that truth, we can be set free. It gives us like wings to fly to the sun to the face of God. But of course we know that Jesus' words are met with a certain skepticism by the leaders, not from his followers, but from the Jewish leaders who didn't Im really like the implication that they were somehow prisoners. They didn't like that implication. So there was a big tension there. So Jesus, you could say, narrows down the real reason why they lack freedom or why they might be in slavery. And it doesn't have to do with politics. It doesn't have to do with the Roman Empire. It has to do with sin. That's the real slavery, the slavery of sin. Personal sin is like a, it's like a chain that locks us down. It keeps us away from our purpose, from our meaning, from our road to God. So he confronts the Jewish leaders 
that were hostile to him, that wanted to kill him, telling them that they have been hardened in their sin. He says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Of course, a slave is not somebody who's free. A slave has to work for his master. He's a slave. He, he can't do what he wants. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, he says. Sin, in our tradition, is a kind of it's a kind of non-being, like an illusion, if you will. It's kind of like to live in sin is to kind of live in an unreal world. Our mind becomes, when we're in sin, we, we become confused, we become disoriented. We're, in a, we're living in a lie. That's why we say the devil is the father of lies. And, of course, all of us sinners have, to one degree or another, bought into that lie. And at the heart of that lie, ultimately, of sin, and this is the subject of today's meditation with you, Lord, at the heart of the reality of sin is ultimately the deification of our own ego. Our own ego. I become the center of the universe, the I with my needs, my fears, my demands, I become, as we say, egocentric. The ego is the center. There's a famous uh, French mathematician, inventor, theologian from the 17th century. His name was Blaise Pascal. And he, he wrote some, he had a, a beautiful conversion and he wrote some beautiful words and he wrote very powerful words about the power of self-centeredness. He said, I quote here from one of his writings, he said, man has two lives. One is his true life, and the other one is the imaginary life, that he lives in his own opinion or in that of other people. We work hard to embellish and conserve our imaginary being. And we neglect our true being. If we have some virtue or some merit, we are careful to make it known in some way or another so as to attach these virtues to that imaginary existence. We would rather separate them from ourselves to join them to it, and we would willingly be cowards in order to acquire the reputation of being brave. Imagine you're, you act like a coward in order to look like you're brave. Is it possible that I really care much more about what others think than what our Lord thinks of me? Maybe I don't say that explicitly, maybe not consciously, but we do have to humbly learn the art of putting the self in its place, where it belongs. That is, under the aegis of humility, under, you could say, the guidance and the spirit of service to others. The self has to be in its place. I think it was Bishop Barron at one point who said that when the tiny I, our I, le moi, as we say in French, is the center of the cosmos, the tie that, that binds all things to another, well, then we are in some ways lost. Everything becomes rivalry, competition, mistrust. That's why we ask our Lord now for the grace to really die to ourselves. Not to live for ourselves, but 
die to ourselves? How do I die to myself? How do I do that? To die sounds, sounds pretty severe. But we all have had the experience of being too focused on ourselves, on our needs. Often the center of gravity in our thoughts and in our imagination can mainly be the impression we might have made here or there. Did I make a good impression? Did they like what I said? Was I good enough? Did I do a good job? Did they like me? Did they appreciate my contribution? We're, we're kind of turning around that. You know? I'm sure all of you are very familiar, of course, much more than me, with the uh, spin cycle in a washing machine, right? First you put the clothes in. I mean, you know this better, obviously, but you put the clothes in, and then you put a bit of, I guess you put some soap in some place, and then you turn it on, and then water and soap goes in, and, and the thing starts, you know, cleaning, and then, but then comes the spin cycle, right? And it starts to spin. Right? The cylinder spins and all the clothes goes to the edge of the cylinder and all the water gets sucked out. It goes very fast, probably sometimes the whole machine shakes, you know, bounces practically. Now imagine our thoughts. Our activities are kind of stuck in this spin cycle, our thoughts. And if we don't slow it down, all the water, you could say, all the good aspirations, all the purifying grace gets like kind of like sucked out of us. We're dried out. I mean, I guess it's for some reason that we are baptized with water, right? But it's like the, the, the water of our baptism is kind of kind of sucked out if we are constantly thinking and spinning over and over about ourselves. Lord, help me to stop the spin cycle, to unplug the machine. And as you have probably have to do here, you have to call the pro to fix it. You know? And he comes to fix the machine. And of course, the pro, the, the one who will repair us, is the divine master that we have heard so often. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? That's that's pretty clear and compelling evidence of what we're invited to do. Deny himself. He must deny himself. We must deny himself. Take up our cross and follow our Lord. But it also supposes that there is already a default system that is deeply ingrained in us that we have to weed out throughout our life. Some people realize this and they start doing it but others don't realize that they should work on this some people don't realize that they have to lose their life now, whoever would save his life will lose it whoever loses his life for my sake will find it so that person has suddenly kind of gone through a conversion But it's always a tendency within us to be self-centered, just to basically look after ourselves. The big me, as David Brooks says in one of his books. He believes, David Brooks, he believes that, that this is, there's more of that today. And developing a true character has more to do with taking away than with adding more and more an array of possibilities and, and abilities. It's more really, without explicitly saying it, is really talking about dying to oneself as the root of a good character. 
And in one of his addresses to, uh, to a college a few years ago, he said that the moral world is not structured like, like the market world. It has an inverse logic. To develop morally and inside, you have to follow an inverse set of rules. You have to give to receive. You have to surrender to something outside yourself to gain strength within yourself. You have to conquer your desire to get what you crave. Success leads to the greatest failure, which is arrogance and pride. Failure can lead to the greatest success, which is humility and learning. Imagine failure, human failure can lead to success, and that success is what? Humility. In order to fulfill yourself, he says, you have to forget yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. I mean, that's, that's right out of the gospel, really. You, you may remember that distinction that he made in his famous book, The Road to Character, between the resume virtues and the eulogy, eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the ones that you bring to the marketplace, the, men, the ones that will get you a good job, the people see you on your resume. Whereas the eulogy virtues are the moral virtues. They're the things that they say about you after you're dead. In your eulogy. Whether you've been honest, brave, caring, capable of great love. And that's what he goes on about in this book. He says, it's evident, we all know that, the eulogy virtues are much more important than the resume virtues. But we live always in a society and in ourselves, you could say, as giving more importance to the resume virtues. We focus more on how to build our skills than really than to build true character. And the only way really is learning the humble task of, well, dying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is what our father meant when he wrote that searing point in Furrow about the person who thinks, he imagines a person who thinks he's doing a pretty good job, uh, you know, they're not doing anything really bad or not doing like terrible injustices or anything, uh, but they may be in the spin cycle. Right? Like they're turning around themselves, they're thinking mainly about themselves, turning around and around the good things that they do. And this is a point I, I like, uh, I've always found it quite striking. He pictures a good person, a good girl, you know, that prays and, and uh, you know, gets good marks, does a good job in her work, good professional. He's, he describes this person. You fulfill a demanding plan of life. You rise early, you pray, you frequent the sacraments, you work or study a lot, you are sober and mortified, but you are aware that something is missing. Consider this in your conversation with God. Since holiness, or the struggle to achieve it, is the fullness of charity, you must look again at your love of God and your love of others for His sake. Then you discover, hidden in your soul, great defects that you have not even been fighting against. You're not being a good son or, or daughter, a good brother or sister, a good companion, a good friend, a good colleague. And that, since you love your holiness, he says, your holiness, in a disordered manner, you are envious. You sacrifice, quote, yourself in many small personal details, and so you are attached to yourself, to your own person. 
And deep down, you do not live for God or for others, but only for yourself. It's a, those are strong words. You know, to, to imagine, it seems like a very harsh point that our founder, St. Rosemaria, is making here, and does suggest that this person, nevertheless, did kind of discover these pathologies in their soul, but only after some time. Because he said, you realize that there's, you know, there's something wrong. There's something missing. You realize. So that person did come to realize. It's as though our Lord had guided this person, who was, from our founder's description here, quite egocentric and mainly concerned about his own or her own sanctity here. But since they prayed, they were open to God's grace and perhaps came to realize that they were not a good brother or a good companion, a good colleague. They, they realized, maybe I'm not a good, I'm not truly what I ought to be in my context. One senses a contrition for these failures. And that contrition brings true humility, real change, and ultimately a true desire to forget about self. And that's good. So we can say that thanks to the life of piety and prayer, well, we can become at least aware of the biggest obstacle in our life, pride. So that's it. We, Lord, we ask you now, help us to overcome that obstacle by forgetting ourselves. This pride, which is a disordered love of self. Disordered love of self. We can tell him in our prayer, Lord, I don't want to have that disordered love of myself that could blind me in hearing you in advance. Doesn't mean we have to hate ourselves, we have to love ourselves in a proper way and recognize the gifts that we have received, of course. We have to love God, we have to love our neighbor and ourself. You must love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. So that's three, that's, that's three loves, like a tripod. Like that camera's on a tripod, <laughs> and all legs of the tripod have to be solid. Sometimes we don't properly love ourselves. It doesn't mean we, we become the center of the universe, but we do have to learn how to, you could say, die to ourselves, forget ourselves. And that's why the, we know when we're striving for holiness, we have to learn to snap out of this stifling, subjective attitude about my own sanctity, my things, my things. And we seek the presence of the Blessed Trinity that is dwelling in our soul, who will guide us. And pick up on those signs of self-centeredness, like if we have too much concern about our health, too much concerned about professional matters, we're really, really focused in on our, our rest, we have to get our rest, our exercise, our relaxation, and that's like really, really important. Or maybe what the future has in store, and we find it difficult to abandon, we tend to micromanage things. That kind of attitude, to be mainly focused about those things, they don't, they don't fit for us, for us Christians. If we truly love God, we have given ourselves to Him. And even at times when the cross is a little bit more difficult. We know that our Blessed Mother, when she received the message of an angel, of the angel telling her her mission, she asked for clarification and immediately ran off to go and help her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant and therefore undergoing um, the difficulties of that moment. She ran, she ran, the Gospel says, with haste. If we could run with haste to serve others, to give of ourselves, but especially run with haste to simply turn off the spin cycle when we're thinking too much about ourselves. Mm -hmm serve others, 
sometimes we know with a simple modification of a nice smile. Our Lord will make use of us and help us to overcome that pride. And our Blessed Mother will help us to be humble with her intercession. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.